Well, man, what you guys are about to witness is really uh, uh, what I think is mm, in the top five most important conversations I've ever had on any topic. Um, my interview or conversation, however you want to view it, is with a YouTube channel called Star Path Academy. And this is a guy who lived through hyperinflation in Romania in the 1990s. And I wanted to talk to him because it's one thing to talk about hyperinflation and to look at historical accounts and postulate why, what it might be like to live through hyperinflation. But um, it's another thing to have actually lived through it and to be able to share your experience. And so um, Star Path Academy, I am going to leave the link to his channel in the description as well as the three-part video series links in the description as well. I encourage you to go watch all of those at some point, whether it's before or after watching this video. But um, one thing I want to express, and I only say this because he expressed it to me, is um, he... It's very important to him that people do not think of him as some kind of an expert or know-it-all or that he is, is better or smarter than anybody. I don't think you're gonna watch this video and get that impression at all. Um, he's a very humble, meek gentleman who is very concerned for the welfare of others. And he said after we stopped recording that if this story was important enough to share with one person, then he feels that he should share it with as many people as possible. And um, so I'm, I've said enough. This is a long video. I'm gonna, uh, I have everything um, down below. I have everything um, time stamped so you can get to different aspects of the conversation, but I encourage you to watch the whole thing because it's excellent stuff. So with that, here's the interview. All right, everybody, welcome back to my channel. I am here with Star Path Academy, and the reason I want to talk to, to this gentleman is because he made a three-part video series that was about his experience living through hyperinflation in the 1990s in Romania. This is an important topic because we can all look at history of Weimar Republic, uh, you know, Romania, um, Venezuela, Zimbabwe, and things like that, and we can we can learn from the stories of history that maybe have biases or narratives of the people telling those stories. Or we can talk to people like, like Star Path Academy here who has firsthand experience going through it. And um, I have, my grandparents lived through the Great Depression and it completely formed, or it completely informed the way that they lived the rest of their lives. And so their lessons are not forgotten on me. And so that's why I wanted to have Star Path Academy on my channel tonight so that we can all learn from his experience. You know, we can, um, right now, the word inflation is trending on Google. This is something that is on everybody's minds. So with that being said, um, Star Path Academy, thank you for coming on my channel. Um, why don't you just start by kind of briefly telling us why you made the video series and uh, what's happened since then? Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> it's nice being on your channel and thank you for the invitation. I'm really honored. Um, so since I moved to the United States and started talking about, you know, my childhood or early, um, early years, um, what kind of we went through in Romania during communism or the end of communism and the hyperinflation period that followed soon after, they always seemed intrigued. And they told me that I should write the blog or I should do something. I never did uh, because, well, frankly, I didn't know if it was anyone really interested or they were just telling me that. But um, as more people kind of got on and, um, I, I would I would look at them and they were truly were sincere that they would be stuck on the story. I thought like, yeah, sure, let me write the blog, but um, that takes time. And I thought, let's just sit, let me sit down and see where this goes. And um, you know, it uh, it seemed like it attracted a lot of people, and I'm really hum humbled by um, all of your nice comments and uh, you inviting me here. And it's really just my 
personal story. A lot of people, everyone in Romania went through it. So I don't necessarily feel special. Um, it's just maybe I spent a lot of time with my grandparents and um, I started studying economy very early on. And um, just from the family stories, I was always intrigued what's happening to us. And I wasn't sure what was happening. So later on, as I studied more and more, I kind of like saw like the economy part and then matched that to something from memory and kind of put these together. So my videos are really um, now merging the knowledge that I acquired with the memories that are, are coming from uh, my early manhood or childhood even. So, How old were you? Because this was, this was 1989, 1990. Yeah, I, so. I was very young. I was very young. I was in my teens. So, okay. like, um, yeah, I've, most of the experience that I'm talking is usually how I saw my parents go through some of these, um, you know, n hard periods. And for me, it was just questions why don't we have toilet paper <laughs> or why does toilet paper have pieces of uh, newspaper inside of it because you know it, and then I would not understand this and they would give their best answer you know and also I experienced their hardship and um, kind of what the family life looks like under these situations um, so I have great great respect for my parents um, and um, that generation so they went, I think they really experienced the real hardships. And for me as, you know, a um, young teen, it was sort of like, well, I was young, you know, I was healthy. It was just life. And everywhere I looked, it seemed normal because all my friends went through the same. So it wasn't like, um, I never felt that it's, it was just life for me. You know, I didn't feel special that we're doing so bad. You know, eventually when we were, after or during the end of the period of the communism where kind of VHS um, like cassettes or whatever was kind of smuggled in and we were able to get it to like someone who actually had a TV or watch it, then we would see like how life was different outside. And then we would have compare, oh yeah, we're really poor, you know, but it wasn't still bad. We, we actually liked watching those movies and usually they were movies from the 60s or something very old. So my yeah. generation might actually have our old souls in the sense that the movies that we saw may be your parents' generation <laughs> because it was never the latest movies that were smuggled in. It was always like 20 years old or something like that. So um, we then kind of realized what was going on. But um, yeah, we actually aspired to live one, you know, eventually the american dream or the what the west uh, has or had <laughs> at right yeah. so i wonder so you and i are probably about the same age because i remember being like in like eighth or ninth grade when uh ceausescu lost power that was ceausescu in romania at the time right, right? and yes. communism fell and then the the inflation started and it's funny the only reason i remember that is from a saturday night live skit <laughs> when, I was a, when i was a kid everyone would say ceausescu's name and then spit spit on the ground <laughs> ceausescu <laughs> oh, <yeah. laughs> but anyhow i do remember that uh because I, that was my first year of civics and uh, I think I was a freshman in high school. So as a young man, before things started to get really hard, did you have a sense that your parents or your grandparents were starting to see problems on the horizon that they were starting to prepare for? Or was this something that just kind of hit Romania like a tidal wave and everyone was completely surprised by it? Right. So maybe I'm a bit younger, but I do remember a lot of things and the more emotion you kind of put to a memory, the harder it sticks. And um, so it started with um, the fall of communism in Romania. I'm talking about the hyperinflation period. And that really started with the execution of Ceausescu. Um, but even before that, you could start feeling that there was kind of unrest on the street. Um, it started with a bishop in Timisoara. And you would see that people want more. They're not, they don't necessarily want to live like this anymore. Even though communism was kind of easing at that point, I believe, from what my parents were saying anyway. 
and um, eventually it just popped and um, people had enough and then it was the revolution of um, 89 I, I don't necessarily turn to Wikipedia a lot but I read through Wikipedia about the revolution of 89 in Romania it does it does give you the basics of what kind of happens to if, if any of your listeners want to um, kind of uh, get that what actually happened then then it was a period of euphoria I would say of a half year or so where we did it you know we have a new old transitional government or whatever and <laughs> I'm not sure if that was a catalyst or not, but people did start to spend their money more because, um, and my aunt put it the best way, if you want to kind of imagine the period before and after. So before we had money, but we were not able to spend it because there were no products. And then later we had uh, products on the shelves because, you know, Western companies could come in but we had no money to purchase anything so it was like yes money no products no money products that was kind of the and it was a shift immediate that half a year or maybe a couple of months that happened immediately if that started afterwards and i don't necessarily want to draw parallels but if you have the feeling now after the lockdowns we're sort of going into that phase where people are kind of breathing they start to spend their money and um you know we we had that experience when communism it was everyone was sort of in a lockdown situation you were not necessarily talking about certain topics you were not necessarily out on the street you even if you had money you couldn't spend it or just in similar cases now you could not go to restaurants well back then we very had very few restaurants or anything like that but um, it's sort of that, that type of situation that happened, that euphoria. Now we can leave the streets and talk about anything and spend our money, have our freedoms, and so on. Uh, and I'm not necessarily even bashing communism. Communism had its own sort of like positives, but it was, you have to ask the question at what cost. So it did have some positives just like capitalism has its own positives you have to kind of measure and what the people wanted at that point and i think at that point they went at a breaking point and they just wanted to change immediately and they had enough and before before you uh, think about too much i'm thinking that ca communism had its very um strict purpose at that time and the purpose was to pay off the debt pay off the national debt and they eventually did right um, so for that purpose, um, after that 10 years austerity measures that we had during the 80s, uh, we were able to do it. But then sort of that common goal stopped being a common goal. We didn't have a common goal and people just, well, let's have our freedoms now. You know, we achieved it. So it was sort of achieving the goal kind of also ended communism, but it was much more than that. There was a lot of people suffering. So I don't want to, you know, it's just a lot of opinions and people, no matter what kind of situation or no matter what kind of system you have, there will always be some people for it and some people are against it. But I think at this point, towards definitely the end of communism, people, most people had enough and they just went out in the street and uh, ended it at all. You know, I remember it. in your first video, you mentioned how good the Romanian economy was in, in that during that communistic stage and leading to the end of it where the debt was paid off in Romania, I think you said was the only country to have really done so <laughs> with, um, right. with, with fiat currency. So, so what was, you said that the people were just kind of sick of it. Was there a, um, I mean, I guess in America when we, at least people of my generation, you know, I kind of grew up in the Cold War where there was always kind of the threat of, you know, nuclear holocaust and things like that. And so we have this view of communism as being this highly tyrannical, um, you know, dragged off to gulags if you speak against the state kind of a thing. Is, is that... Is, was there any of that being experienced in? Yes, definitely. That was so. That was definitely experienced. Um, I'm. I when I was saying that it's good for something, I wasn't necessarily saying it's good from the human perspective. 
it's good for achieving a goal. And that's why I said, like, what was the cost of that? Right. Um, so, yes, those are two. We had the gulags. Uh, that was sort of the Russian side. Of course, we had political prisoners in Romania. But I don't necessarily want to talk about too much about communism because I was young. And from what um, my experience is, what through my parents' eyes, and what, it's not necessarily you know, first-hand experience because I was very young at that age. I was sort of like more in tune from my memory from the 90s on. Okay. But um, I would advise you to go as exactly as you said. If you want to learn about communism, go and ask the people who lived in communist countries during that age uh, and they're still ar- alive and they're still old enough to tell you how it was. And um, what you mentioned is, um, is kind of what what happened yeah. okay so let's let's talk a little bit then more about the economic ramifications and the personal experience that you had living through um, the hyperinflation and and I'll tell you there there are two things that really stood out to me when you talked about surviving hyperinflation and it's something that concerns me about this nation should hyperinflation ever come to us is you talked about how there were family farms and most children are living in their parents or their grandparents' homes and their neighbors were probably a second cousin or something like that. So there was a very strong sense of community where you were helping one another. And you very, you very much talked about just the importance of, of having a strong community and then you said kindness being kind to one another. Those are two things that I think America is kind of lacking right now, if, at least if you watch CNN, right? <laughs> um, you know, there's a lot of civil unrest, there's a lot of tribalism, and there's not very much coming together. Do you, do you notice the same thing in this country? I don't know how long you've been here and, and things like that, but do you see any parallels between what you experienced as a child and what's happening now in the United States? And are there any concerns that you have? And talk about, talk just a little bit about that family element and community and the importance of survival in that circumstance. Sure. So um, in this way, I think the two situations are different. Um, because in the 80s and even in the 90s in Romania, the, the, fal- the family element was very strong. So um, we lived together. Sometimes there were houses where multiple generations lived together, um, being raised by a grandmother because maybe two, both of the parents were working. Um, and then having a cousin as close as your um, sibling always there. It was, it was different. The closest that I could... Hmm. match this is the situation of the um, Hispanic community in America where I, I, li- I did live in Southern California and enjoyed it a lot. Eventually I left um, where I did have interactions with this, um, with the, with the Mexicans there. And that kind of felt more closer to me where there was the grandmother and the grandchildren and it was a huge family. And when there was a celebration, a lot of people there, long tables you know and so that was more closer so if if anyone has a really good chance of surviving hyperinflation it's, it's those type of families so um i think that was sort of like i want to kind of paint a picture that you can imagine that was sort of the situation of course we were living under communism so it was a bit more strict and our behavior was not that free and so on but um that's how I would paint that picture. Everyone's so close, everyone knowing, you know, if somebody needs help, um, even from the extended family, right? And I have nine cousins, and so um, we were 10 cousins, right? And then each of us had their parents, and some were, I'm the youngest, actually, so some had their um, fiance. So it was, it was that situation. But we had nothing, we were very poor. Um, so uh, compared to, you know, of course I understand there are like third world countries and so on. And I feel for those people, but you might not necessarily, they are so far away that you might necessarily, um, like even think in that terms. But if I'm talking about maybe that middle term where we were very, very poor, but kind of 
in the middle, you might relate more. So that's what I'm talking about. Anyway, so we had really nothing. We were living paycheck by paycheck and government subsidies and government this and help that and um, money for the, ch for the children. And you kind of can imagine what Venezuela is maybe is going through. Um, so, but that we, we had, did have that very, very strong uh, family values. Everybody was really close. Um, even before this thing hit, we were sometimes visiting the grand, my grandfather on the, on the same place where eventually you had to, we were forced back to. Um, so we had, we were poor, but we were family rich, I would say. Whereas now when my observation is um, in the United States, it is that people have capital, but they are family poor. They, they move a lot. They don't make relations with their neighbors. They don't necessarily know how their, you know, third cousin is doing or something like that, which uh, is, is very important to me still because that was kind of my upbringing. Um, so I, I missed that because I, you know, I talk with my neighbors and they, they're not necessarily, of course, they're not my cousins, but again, it's... Um, they're not necessarily open to um, to building a community, whereas in my memory, neighbors or even sometimes if they're not your cousins, everybody knows down until the last house on the street how many children they have, their names, um, their birthdays, and you give them something or whatever. So it's very very different. So you know, as soon as we moved to the United States, and eventually we were able to actually afford a house. I, I've been in the United States over 10 years. Okay. Um, eventually, the very first thing we wanted to have is that community or rebuild that community. So my wife started baking, making bread and other stuff. And eventually we were the, the weird ones <laughs> giving everyone like our home cooked food. Hey, would you want some? Or showing up on the porch hey we have these herbs from our backyard you know would you like some so we were trying to build that and some people were open and we're really close now but some people were not and you know that's fine but it was just a different experience yeah you'd be welcome to be my neighbor brother let me <laughs> tell you i would love that stuff it's funny because my wife and i moved back into a neighborhood we lived here uh two years ago and it's the kind of neighborhood where everyone's very close. There's block parties right. and backyard campfires every weekend in someone else's backyard. And we moved into a different apartment, um, apartment complex. I mean, it's like 60 or 80 apartments and people didn't even make eye contact with you there. No. And I don't, you know, I'm a bit of a homebody, you know, I don't want, I, I don't necessarily want people peeking in my window saying, hey, what's up neighbor? But at the same time, you know, I want to know that, um, you know, if my kids are misbehaving, I want my neighbors to let me know about it. Or if, or if my children are in danger or something like that and vice versa. If I see someone else's kids getting into trouble or someone who doesn't belong, you know what I mean? And, and we kind of live in that kind of neighborhood now where everybody has that's kind great, of, yeah. but that's uncommon. That is it is it is especially me living in Los Angeles you know it was it was not really <laughs> no one was having that everyone was too busy you know building their career or something like that um now in the mid south i I love this place it's really good and um it's different because you know if a tornado comes and it, or some storm is bl blowing someone's fence over you know. Uh, then I was the first one running with the hammer. Hey, neighbor, do you need help? And yeah. people appreciate that. You can help. You don't have to help with a lot of money. You can help with your time. You can help with your kindness. And I say honesty because there's a type of kindness which is not honest, which I yes. experienced in California a lot. People were very kind but not necessarily honest. And it goes just a lot, not such a long way that people would think. Um, so here it's the different, and I don't want to bash Californians. I loved loved it there, but it was just not, you know, what I was seeking. Maybe it was because the it was the big city. Let me let me transition because you said something really important about a tornado hitting and going with and helping neighbors with hammers and stuff. You mentioned <laughs> that um, in hyperinflation, things that you once considered important become unimportant and things that were once considered unimportant become important. And the other thing that you talked about was the importance of having a skill. 
having right. the ability to swing that hammer and accurately hit a nail and drive a nail. Talk a little bit about that. Talk a little bit about, um, cause you, you were, you kind of left that hang. You said things that would become important, right. things that were important become unimportant. What, for example, what, what would you say that was important before hyperinflation becomes unimportant during hyperinflation? Right. So I did left that hanging and for, for good reason, because there's a lot and I was kind of trying to kind of sprinkle in maybe every video a little bit. And then from maybe a couple of videos, you get a, not a bigger picture instead of me having a list <laughs> and kind of yeah. reading things off. But um, so right now everybody's has their, you know, apps and their, so I'm a software engineer. I don't, I don't want to bash software. I'm, I'm in that field and I love what I'm doing, but I'm also like a hobby carpenter. <laughs> so anyway, so right now, just examples off the top of my head right now, people are looking, their stock ticking, you know, stock tickers and what's my, you know, Robin hood, whatever stock I bought is doing or Weeble or this and that event. Like those types of things are, you're interested in when you have the basics already and you have the foundation or you think you have the foundation, you might not have it. If you don't have 10 cousins or 10 really close friends, you might not have it, but you don't think you need it until you actually really need it. So these are sort of like upper tier needs or you need that adrenaline rush where Bitcoin is going up or down or you, you like your shows or whatever. Um, but these are, these are building on something that you think you have that you might not have, right? And when, when hyperinflation happens or if would happen in the United States, these are no longer important because you're going back to basics. What is, uh, so just brands, like people are showing off the brands of their car or the, their shoes. You know? <laughs> That's so alien for me that uh, like people spend so much on these stuff. Uh, when I was happy if I had the shoe. Yeah. Um, so anyway, uh, the, these things that are socially, you know, you need social approval of look how good I'm doing. Look what I'm investing because in my world, like that's the latest hit. Now people are buying stocks and selling stocks and trying to get rich fast and uh, easy. So anyway, so like social approval, look at the brand of my car, right? And look at, you know, how nice shoes I have or how, look at me in, on Instagram taking selfies in a very expensive bar. <laughs> you won't care about, you know, what people think about you when, yeah. you know, you're down on your knees searching for food, uh, you know, in your whatever, you know, Something whatever that, you're in, uh, in the backyard to see, to, you know, grab some dandelions to eat. Of course, and that's and that's something but, that's something you actually did do, though. You had to. You talked about yeah. digging potatoes by hand, yeah. side by that's, side with your grandfather, so that so you could eat for your yeah. grandma. Yes. Yeah. So uh, yes, of course, that's potatoes was was the main thing that we grew because it was easy to store if you had a good root cellar and carrots and those types of roots are really easy to store. Of course, we had grain and some other stuff, but we actually didn't have the equipment. Uh, so we inherited some uh, land that was outside of the um, uh, the homestead that we, we, were, we were able to rent. And uh, people who had equipment prior, because you won't be able to buy equipment then, but people who had equipment prior, we were able to lend that land and they paid in, in, um, in wheat, in grain, basically sacks of grain. And then we would take the grain um, to the mill and then we would get a uh, flour instead of for, for X amount of uh, grain, we would get X amount of flour. It's always less because people would always right. like, would do the cost. And then we would take that um, to the bakery or sometimes my grandmother baked bread. So we would have this chain and there was no cash in between because we were just like going from one acquaintance or neighbor to another, to another, to another. So that's how we had grain and other stuff. But what we were growing is vegetables and, um, and roots. Um, so potatoes was the main thing and that's 
what was almost like currency for us. <laughs> yeah, and no one's no one's going to take that selfie and put it on Instagram, right? right like, right, here's right. me and Grandma digging potatoes by you know. Well, maybe with our... now they will yeah. because actually I've seen um, a lot of uh, homesteaders uh, now. On oh Instagram. yeah, yeah. So it's that becoming, is, uh, and it's actually I'm I'm really happy to see that <laughs> I can relate more. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting because the prepping movement, which yeah. up until coronavirus, they were seen as like some fringe weirdos. Now, during, you know, when the coronavirus hit, it's like, well, maybe those preppers were onto something. Um, right. Do you? Do you follow the principles of prepping in America? And do you think that they're, they have the right idea should a hyperinflationary um, scenario hit? Or are, they, are there some things that you think are missing in their um, philosophy of, of prepping for like the worst case scenario? I was on an airplane once when um, I was changing the channels and I, there was a prepping show and I absolutely enjoyed it a lot. But I felt there was a lot of fear and there's a lot of like motivation from fear in that movement, which is good because I mean, one way, because fear is one of your biggest motivations that you can have. Um, the other is greed, I believe. <laughs> there's yeah. others like love and so on. But these are very strong negative ones. and. Um, but if you're consumed by fear, and I'm not saying everyone is, but in that show, I saw a couple of, uh, who were. Um, so in the prepping movement, I'm not like putting a, an umbrella on the prepping movement. I'm just seeing like saying that what I saw in these specific scenarios. So when you're motivated by fear, you might overdo some st steps and you might underdo some other steps. And then there's, of course, you know, those who sell uh, merchandise into these movements and I understand they have to make their money and the, they have the, their YouTube creators and so on but what I'm seeing like um, they sometimes overestimate and I'm not saying I'm, whatever could happen I'm, I don't see the future but they it, they see a total societal collapse right and in those situations which might happen I don't know yeah I'm just saying that's probably a less chance than you know maybe a dollar collapse and the dollar collapse doesn't necessarily will have like a total Mad Max scenario, which could happen, but maybe you should prep first for the most possible and then the probable or, you know, the whatever. Well, I think you're getting it. Yeah. yeah. So first, what's your biggest chance of what's happening? And then do, do have and to cover those extreme scenarios, but don't necessarily start over there because you have a limited amount of money to prep, right? And this is also sort of like, American prepping that's that means you already have capital for us prepping was okay let's take a shovel and dig a hole so we can make a root cellar right whereas the American prepping is what's the best solar furnace that I should buy because if the society is collapsing then I'll have to cook my rice you know and maybe you should buy the rice first then you know <laughs> buying the solar cooker because you're probably going to have some wood or you'll, you'll figure it out how to prepare that rice for, you know, but um, generally I think like I look up to them because they have, even though it might not happen, they at least are, they're covering their basics. Right. But I think there should be like a measured um, way of approaching it instead of like, the world is ending tomorrow. Let's spend everything we have today and then buy stuff that we'll never use, which is yeah. happening. And I feel like these people should have a better guidance because they have the right idea, but they're motivated from fear. The other people that I saw who were motivated by maybe hobby or enjoyment, and that's much more nicer to see so in, in the same movement or in the same show i saw that people are actually enjoying it you know some people enjoy i don't know collecting luxury cars and good for them right. you know that's their enjoyment or going to bars day and night you know and that's their life it's their choice we should say okay you know but then people enjoy collecting i don't know um tools maybe or um prepping or actually do some really good steps or gardening or you know homesteading and that's their choice right 
so I do see some really good, um, you know, videos where people are doing from, you know, collecting rainwater, but they're having fun at it, you know, right. but I, th I think that if you can shift from the fear mentality to kind of this mentality, I think you're going to do really good. And also there's a lot of, um, if you don't mind me, I'll just go. No, keep going. Yeah. Um, so, and these are my opinions and it's fine if you disagree with me, I'm totally fine with it. I'm just a dude, you know, I don't, I'm not the prepping expert. Um, but my opinion is that a rolling pantry is somewhat better than, um, like hoarding a lot of stuff that you might not ever eat, you know, uh, whenever you're going out purchasing something, you know, purchase three, what you used to have purchase one, like maybe cans or you used to purchase one bag of rice, you know, purchase three, if you can afford it, then have two spare. And next time you have four spare and then have a, have a big enough pantry where you can kind of roll and you use the, the one that's is about to expire or expiring soon and kind of put the new one back in, you know, back in the, the line and kind of consume it that way. So that's what we did back in Romania. We, because um, well, first of all, we didn't have the ability to have go out and buy everything, right? So when you had maybe some cash or whatever, you sold something and you had cash, you bought what was available and you went to the market and there was, you couldn't go just like, let me buy some rice. There was no rice. There was maybe potatoes and there was corn. And then you, okay, well, I already have some potatoes. So I'm going to buy corn this time. But it right. wasn't like your choice that you, what you will be able to buy. It was what's available, maybe what you can trade for it. And um, so that way, it, it actually, we were forced to do it in a more practical way because cash was very, very limited or the resources were very limited. So you have to make a really good conscious decisions on what you will buy. Because if not, you know, um, you might not survive next month. So unfortunately, you know, my, my grandparents lived through the great depression. Um, my grandfather, uh, lived until he was 90, 96 years old. And, um, he told stories all the time. Um, he inherited the family farm before the depression and he lost it during the depression yeah. and his, I, I see his, I see the old family homestead, which is now owned by another family. And he tells the story of walking to town to get on a bus to go to Milwaukee and get a job, you know, and he, he had nothing down there waiting for him. He was just going, well, there's, there's cities, there's a city down there. There must be work. And that the, the things that happened during the depression completely informed their everyday life for the rest of their life. I'll, and I'll give you a, a really practical example of this. I remember my grandmother unrolling a stick of butter, right? Put the butter, she put the butter on the plate and then she would lay the wax paper flat and take a spatula and scrape every You're ounce not doing that? of butter. <laughs> she, and you know, I right. do do that because that's okay. how I grew up watching her do that. And, yeah. and, you dare not waste anything. I we were we were deer hunters, and there wasn't a scrap of meat left on a bone anywhere. You just mm -hmm. it was foolish to throw those things away. So waste was something my grandfather never tolerated. It made him very very angry. And we live in a nation now that is so wasteful that you can go to people's garages and buy things on the weekend and resell it on eBay <laughs> and make money doing it. So my question to you with that story is, is how has living through hyperinflation inform, as a child informed your adulthood? Um, how do you view money? And I don't, I, I'm not asking for you to like lay out how you invest your money or anything, but um, do you consider yourself to be prepared should another round of hyperinflation come in your lifetime? Right. Well, let me answer the first part of that question. So, and I would, I, I will eventually do a full video series on this because our lives were changed forever. My life, my son's life, um, 
will be changed forever because he will see how my wife and I are acting. As you said, you do the butter thing. We do it as well. Like, I go <laughs> and if I find a screw on the street, I pick it up and I put it in my pocket because if I go home, I have little jars of different size screws and I put it in. And if I fi find a nail or I miss a nail, I, you know, it, you don't throw anything away. You kind of straighten it and you make it sure or re you reuse everything and everything. So I'll, I will do probably a video series because for me, that's, it's even hard to realize that not everyone is doing that. <laughs> yeah. So I have to, I have to compare. Oh, okay. So you're throwing that away. Okay. Like just another almost sad example was that when eventually um the utan the plastic utensils came in to romania the ones you throw away yep. my mother would not throw them away i had a hard time throwing it away and i have to consciously make a decision to throw it away because if yep. not i'm going to be wiping it and maybe we'll reuse it and of course you can't always <laughs> you know it, you can't hoard that stuff <laughs> right but anyway so it's our lives was changed forever and it was it was already like that during communism because you had to be resourceful to kind of live through that but it went hyper gear during the hyperinflation yeah i would imagine for the second part of the question i don't pre i mean i don't consider myself prepared i could never be prepared enough um, and to, to be honest, I still have a bias, a really positive bias towards America and to, West, to the West, because I, as I told you, like, um, no, it can't happen here. You know, surely we are too rich here for it, for it to happen to us. So my emotional body or my emotions say, no, this is so good. Why would it ever happen? Look at how positive people are here. Uh, but then my logic kind of kicks in. Oh, this is a sign. Oh, that's another sign. Maybe I should, maybe I should just buy two more sets of potatoes. Maybe. So I'm, I kind of started late. I think many, many Americans are way better prepared than I am. Uh, so um, I don't consider myself prepared, but um, again, I think, and I don't want to alarm you, but there's no way how you can prepare for this. You can, you can, Put food away for a month, six months, seven months. You can't put away for seven years. So the way for being prepared is being self-sustainable. Like I'm, yeah. So being to be able to sustain yourself during the period, have that farm. You know, have those chickens right now, and have that chicken coop right now. Raise some pigs right now. My my cousins um, raised pigs back then. So again, this barter thing, I'll, I'll go, come back a little bit about barter, but sometimes like we would give stuff away for free. And even us, like if someone was in real need and we could see it, whatever potatoes we have, we, we would just give, a, you know, give some because that was life. Like eventually you're kind of greedy if you're seeing the light at the end of the tunnel and you want to run for it so you want more and more and more for yourself so you get there faster right you read about these really rich people and yeah i want to be like that so i'm gonna i'm gonna be greedy and do it of course i'm exaggerating but when you have no way of even dreaming about that you actually become a much nicer person because you don't you don't care about you know, stuff that much anymore because you know that you will not be able to get, you know, rich that rich anyway. So might as well just have fun and uh, enjoy life and um, help other people. So I would imagine that your greatest currency in that situation of living through hyperinflation is, is probably good relationships and being the yeah. person who is viewed as honest, trustworthy, keeps, keeps his or her word and as a Never hard worker, I can, I can depend on, you know, I can depend on Star Path Academy to come over and help me till my garden in the springtime. I know he'll be here <laughs> at sunrise and, you know, that relationship is going to turn into that neighbor coming and helping you till your garden and things like yep. that. Yeah, that was the biggest currency and um, bartering was okay, but people... 
if you haven't lived in these situations, you kind of have ideas of what these would ha- be. But sometimes you ne- don't necessarily barter things. You barter your time. You know, um, there's a Hungarian word for uh, kolako, which means like a lot of people get together and they have one from the group now. And you might not need help, but we'll all get together and won't help that one cousin because he's building something, maybe a smokehouse, right? Or he needs help in the garden. And you don't expect pay at all. You don't barter, you don't do anything. You just go maybe receive some food for that day or right. or the weekend. And you sleep in the shed or you sleep on the ground and um, on some blankets and you help him. And then the end of the weekend, everybody goes home. And it's almost like never really measured who helped who uh so some people get much better <laughs> uh, right. deals but uh but then when you need help the rest of the nine people come and help you you know and of course the bigger the farm you had or the bigger the homestead you have um you'll need more help so you'll get more ahead but that was fine because it was considered like well well it's your cousin who's getting all this and that's like you <laughs> that you weren't necessarily you know have envy for them of course eventually when you're doing this with friends there will always be those one or two but um don't be that one or two because um you might not get invited into the next party yeah <laughs> so, um so honesty be showing up on time was absolutely like if, i don't know how would you survive if you don't have that because um that was your currency sure we bartered with people who were kind of don't necessarily know who they are maybe people from other town close enough that you have some acquaintance who know who knew him and yes you traded but it was it was just most of the time everything was just you know you helping others and them helping you back one thing that concerns me in the in the prepping movement and i'm i'm curious if you if you saw this um, is the hoarding of guns and ammunition and the fear of like rave, roving hordes of bandits coming to steal what you have, you know, coming to, to take from you. Now, um, again, I, I think it's highly unlikely we're going to revert to like a Mad Max kind of a situation in, in America or really in, in anywhere in the Western world. However, um, I'm wondering if you experienced any of that. Was there, were there spikes in crime and theft and burglaries and, and things like that? Because what I've, what I've heard is that in, in these scenarios, the police, they have their own families to worry about. They're not necessarily okay. going to come out and protect what you have when they have their own family to protect. So is there wisdom or necessity in, hoard it, in the stockpiling of guns and ammunition um, at least where you were. I mean, America's different, obviously. We've talked about some of those differences. But did you experience any crime spikes or, or theft or things like that? So I don't necessarily know, like, what would be best case scenario in the U.S. So maybe people who do these things, they have a better idea than me. I can only speak of what happened in, in Romania. Um, but... There, there was definitely spikes in crime. Um, however, um, I'm not sure how to phrase this, not to hurt anyone's feelings is you have probably cities now where the crime is worse than how we had it even under hyperinflation. Um, be, not necessarily the amount of crime because there was a lot of stealing, absolutely. Um, even robbing, but there was almost no murder. I mean, what you like, you know, he maybe he has two sacks of potatoes, you know, it's not worthwhile to murder someone. Of course, we were already um, a poor, you know, um, in a poor condition. And then like, if they would come to steal you, maybe they would steal your crop or they would steal you something. In the United States is different. You you are a rich country, right? There's a lot of stuff to, that <laughs> could be stolen from you. For us, it was it wasn't. And even if somebody would come and steal your stuff, there were consequences, and not necessarily through the police. There were people found 
ways how to deal with these scenarios, which is probably not YouTube friendly, but they were dealt with one way or another. It wasn't that bad. You don't have to think like Mad Max scenarios, but anyway, like people from other towns may be coming and stealing your potatoes right out from the ground during the night, right? So that those things would happen. So there were people, you know, um, night watch crop and that's the stuff. But it, the level of violence wasn't that bad because you're not going to, shoot someone over some potatoes, even if they stole some potatoes from you, right? So we didn't have too much to lose, right? In order to kind of respond with extreme violence or they were never come with extreme violence because what was the exchange during that robbery or theft? It wasn't that valuable anyway, right? Right, right. However, towards the end of the period, as some people were getting rich, um, taking advantage of other people, and this happens, it's just how people are, there were more and more um, violent crimes because there were some had wealth to be lost, you know, uh, or stolen. So I don't necessarily know what the uh, right answer for the American situation is. I just tell what I experienced and what I know the difference is, so it could be very different here uh, than it was back then. Uh, however, I do feel that when there's a lot of hardships, people come together. So you would think that you would have to like go to extremes to get something where actually people come and give you stuff because mm. as I told you, like they don't necessarily have like that ideal like if i don't give the you this sack of potatoes i'm gonna be rich one day right so um a lot of people just became nicer to be honest <laughs> yeah but again I, th I do know that the situation is different the culture is very different and um there are different scenarios so i don't i i don't want to tell that like the elderly and women were kind of sitting ducks. Uh, they were later on, there were gangs and there were some other stuff that actually formed during hyperinflation. We didn't have anything like that during communism. It would be like taken care of immediately by the very strong government forces. Um, so there would never be anything like that. You actually felt much safer during communism unless you feared from the government, of course. Right. Um, but like during, I know my mother was always in fear that there was rumors and these things happened that women were um, attacked for their earrings or something mm. like that. They would just pull it out right on the street and run. So like people had to have ways how to defend themselves. And I'm not against that. So um, definitely, you know, have ways how to defend yourself but it might not be as bad as in your mind you know and yeah. of course that's just my experience i don't necessarily know what would happen in the united states yeah and that's you know that's the wild card it's such a different culture it's just a it's just and a wildly different culture. were highly illegal there so yeah. um i guess when people attacked you it was it was with some other stuff and um it was very rare that they would come for your life. You know, life wasn't worth that much anyway back then. So sad to yeah. say, but probably true. Yeah. Well, let's, yeah. we're getting close to the end of our time together. And, and I'd like to close our conversation talking about gold <laughs> um, because this is a stacking channel and hyperinflation is very much on our minds, which is why we collect gold and silver. You, on, in your video about gold, you shared a piece of jewelry uh, it was your grandmother's necklace. This is a gold um, pendant that my mother-in-law had. And what I would like to talk about is one of the things that you said, and I, I put it in my video talking about this interview, you said that in this country, you can go to the store and buy gold and silver. <laughs> and you said, you said people can do it and they don't, and I don't understand why. Um, is tell me a little bit about what you would if you went into hyperinflation let's say you had 10 of your mother's necklaces 10 just like them 
how would that have helped you during hyperinflation, if at all? What would you be, would you be looking to, would that be a la the last thing on earth you would want to sell and tr or, or barter for some, some flower or, or some such thing? Or, or, or what is the utility, I guess, is what I'm asking. What is the utility of 10 of, your, uh, 10 of those gold necklaces in a hyperinflation scenario? Sure. So it's hard to answer because we didn't have too much gold. <laughs> <laughs> Obviously, None of them. Go yeah, gold was illegal. Gold was illegal um, during communism. People had it from the black market. People even had jewelry, and it wasn't like cops were going, coming to get you because probably their some of their wives had some gold jewelry as well. But it was sort of in the closet somewhere. Okay. Um, so it's hard to answer, but I think. Um, to sum this up would be that people think, and this is gold. Silver is again, I think different, um, but gold is not necessarily valuable to you when everyone is dirt poor because you don't, nobody wants your gold then. Gold they want when you're thinking that, oh my God, something will happen. Let's get as much gold as we want. So at the, early periods, probably uh, before the hyperinflation happens, people will go into gold. That's my experience because they want, they don't know what's going to happen and you can take your gold and run for the hills and you can run until India and sell it there if not, and it will have value, right? Anywhere you go, it will have value. But when everybody's poor and we're digging out potatoes, um, a shovel or a hoe has more value than gold, right? So that's why I'm saying that hmm, gold is not necessarily a hedge against inflation. It's a hedge against government losing control. So when you don't have trust in government that they can take care of you, then you go back to what's real, what's very basic, and towards the very bottom, it's always gold because you know that it had value 6,000 years ago and probably will have value 6,000 years from now. So when there are still rich people, if they start feeling that something's about to happen, they go into gold because whatever happens politically, whatever happens in the government, they can, gold is very dense, value dense as well, and they can pick up a couple of suitcases and just head. You know, so it's very valuable then. During hyperinflation, you have to keep it. It goes underground. It probably goes on deep underground. Nobody Literally, knows. right? <laughs> You're burying it under your potatoes. Probably. <laughs> Some midnight gardening, right? right. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have value there because, well, first, it, was, it already went up in value. So it's very hard to know what you're getting, like how many grams of gold you need for a sack of potato it's going to be even one gram is too much right at that point. right because it already went up in value and um you don't necessarily can measure gold against some other things because you don't know anything it, people are just surviving and then towards the end of the period people still have that memory that oh yes gold i remember and as, as they are getting out of it and getting rich again or being able to you know afford more stuff again oh yes gold yeah i remember let's get some now because you don't know how long it, this will take and so it has probably another bump towards the end um where people gather it and they will be like that for a long time before people forget gold so um like a lot of romanians contacted me after um after the video and they were saying like oh yeah they're stacking I don't necessarily think we're going to go that bad that you need to stack, uh, but it's your money and, you know, you do what you want. And my opinion is it was, it was illegal before it can go illegal again. So you have to kind of put that scenario in what you're going to do about it. Me, um, I'm thinking, since you can't really use gold during the period, you might as well have it in a different country. You don't necessarily have to store it with you um, because it will make your target. 
So mm. of course, me having multiple citizenships helps, <laughs> but and I know. Uh oh, we have a connection issue. Starpath Academy, are you with us? Okay, are you there? Yes. <clears throat> Looks like I'm back. <laughs> okay, super. I think as long as we don't cross talk, the audio should be fine. So as long as I can resist the urge to interrupt you, <laughs> we should be we should oh, be okay. Sure. sure. So you were in the middle of your thought. We were talking about the utility of gold in a right. hyperinflationary scenario, and you were talking about maybe not wanting to keep it on your person and having multiple passports and things like that because it could make you a target, for example. So I'll let you finish your thought on that. Sure. <clears throat> so regarding gold, and of course I'm not a financial advisor. I don't give advice. All of what I'm sharing is just my opinion. And um, you do your own research and consult with your own financial advisor. Um, in my perspective, gold is um, more for um, intergenerational storage of wealth where, um, because gold will outlast hyperinflation, it will outlast the governments of the world, it will outlast you, certainly. Um, so it should be thought as, um, as something that maybe not necessarily an investment, but more for um, as insurance policy uh, against um, failing governments or failing government actions where government may not be able to um, provide its duties and um, only to sort of spend on gold or invest in gold as much as you're willing to leave to your children because you might never necessarily enjoy the benefits of having that gold because maybe it will never go up in your lifetime even it can it, in my opinion it will definitely go up prior hyperinflation as people with large amount of cash or um w very wealthy people will move into it and you could maybe ride that wave uh, however it's not as it you may never even sell that gold you know, so it should be taught as something that maybe you can leave to your children if you never are able to enjoy it. Now, that may not be the case in definitely in hyperinflation under Romania, it did very well. However, it's also a liability. So uh, because if people know that you have gold, it, of course, if it's on your person, that's just outright not good. However, um, it's not even... A good idea to store it um, where you live um, of course not where you live could save you from people but I'm thinking about different jurisdictions so it could save you from um, you know not necessarily good intentions of um, future governments that might come right so in my opinion it's probably best to diversify to other states and countries as well and i was mentioning of course that me having multiple citizenships citizenships helps and I'm, I'm not sure what would be the best option for people who only have one citizenship or uh, live in the country where they also store their gold but in my opinion and i will be sharing some more videos about gold and actually stories um, of people i knew where they um, stored it in a completely different country a bordering country which was which played out very well for them during the romanian hyperinflation i think that's probably your best bet if you if you want to play the gold game uh silver i don't necessarily have too much uh, experience with that um because we did not have investment grade silver i can see where it was um it could have been served as a barter. However, I was talking about Gresham's law in one of my videos, which means that um, when you have two different types of currencies, uh, the worst one or the one that's not performing well will be 
outspend and that's the one that will take over because whatever is valuable for you during these situations you want to keep because it's probably going up in value and you will be trading or bartering everything and everything uh, before you will get to what's more precious for you um, as in capital of course <laughs> yeah uh, so um, that also meant when we were having to trade currency with these um, people who were accepting currency trades during the hyperinflation you could have traded gold however since they were also in the knowledge if you're trading gold that's probably very the very last thing that you're um you're trading that means you're really you know scraping the, the the bottom of the barrel so they would not give you a very well a good price on it of course it's different if you have a network of people already in place where you kind of all know the value of that silver or that something that you want to trade between you uh, and you trust those people barter works okay if it's a smaller community and you have trust that when you're going to trade, the, the trade will actually happen and not something else. In big cities, um, it was only almost always foreign currency that they traded, not necessarily barter. Interesting. Um, yes. So things did. So people did use bartering items as favors um, or acquiring favors in big cities. Um, because the healthcare system was completely broken and there was lines and there was the, the, the doctors didn't have pay. So you, you, you wanted to get ahead somehow, unfortunately, corruption rose. So you would use barterable items to get ahead in some scenarios. But in big cities where people don't trust each other, um, it's very hard to use barter. Of course, there were um, like... Um, um, marketplaces where you could do that but um, even there it was currency and it was the um, first the US dollar and then the German mark the Deutsche mark that was used so people find some other ways of currencies instead of um, trading what's really valuable for them interesting so people were using dollars and Deutsche marks how would you even yeah. How would you exchange your failing currency or would it be something of value, like let's say that necklace that you would trade for US dollars or, or Deutschmarks? That's absolutely correct. So you would trade value for Deutschmarks. Nobody would actually really want your failing currency. Uh, if they want, would want it, it's because they want it and somebody else is not accepting Deutschmark, but that would be a very short period. Uh, at, and you know, a couple of months in, or definitely a year in, it was already everything was marked in Deutschmarks. And if you go to Romania, especially the Transylvanian part of Romania, uh, which is a region in um, in Romania, even today, to this day, if you're selling a house or land, it's actually the price is marked up in euros and not in Romanian lei. It's very rare that they would put it out in Romanian lei especially now with inflation because they don't necessarily believe um, that um, it will hold its value. So they, the, it might be out on the market for a month or two, maybe a year, and you don't want to go and update the price all the time. So you would um, price it in euros and people would accept euros and you would know the price of houses or definitely cars or anything like that still in euros. Even if you go and purchase a, let's say, um, a carrier plan from a major carrier for your phone, even then the prices are marked, it's a five euro plan or it's a two euro plan and not in Romanian lay. Mm. So how did it all end? How did, because I think in your video you said it was a five to seven year period of, of hyperinflation. How, how did it all end? Was there like a currency, like in America, we talk about this great reset that's happening or, or is being predicted. Um, right. Whatever you make of that, was there a currency reset? Did something come along and replace the lay? Or what, what happened? At the That's exactly right. That's how it happened. Eventually, it stopped where everybody was very poor and like the general public could not, you know, 
uh, care anymore about what the, the Romanian lay is doing. Until you're still caring and you're still saving, it will keep on going down. But once people you know, gave up um, and used uh, Deutschmark um, and you know completely gave in to not even counting Romanian lay, it eventually stopped because nobody was selling it. And the printing presses stopped because there was no need for it. So then the new Romanian lay came in and the exchange rate was um, one to 10,000. So everything, absolutely your debt, your um, whatever was marked in old Romanian lay would be remarked in a new Romanian lay at that uh, rate. However, there was a transfer period where actually both currencies were accepted. Um, so I, as a commenter under my video was, um, visiting Romania during that time and he was very strange that he was uh, giving new Romanian lay and he was getting old Romanian lay. So even then Gresham's law kind of went into effect and people wanted to get rid of their old Romanian lay and um, like tourists or whoever came for whatever government contracts would be filled with old Romanian lay and people would um, now start hoard hoarding or at least um, saving the new Romanian lay. Um, so that's how it was reset. And um, re regarding hyperinflation, so if you take a look at Wikipedia, how it defines it, and if you take a look at the numbers, hyperinflation never happened in Romania. Um, <laughs> because there's a certain amount that uh, has to be a, like a percentage that it, I think it's monthly 50% that it has to lose. So we never went full Weimar Republic. But then again, if you take a look at the numbers and I try to recreate these again and again from my experience about knowing the exact prices and what the paper says, and there's discrepancies there, of course, Measured inflation is totally different than street inflation. So like the CPI is weighted and so on. Again, in Romania, according to the papers, hyperinflation never happened. Um, there was high inflation. So, you know, hyperinflation might never happen in the US. Yeah, and the way the media reports things now, who knows um, what they'll call it. So um, should it happen, but you know, brother, I really appreciate you coming on my channel and sharing your your knowledge with us and your experience because it's definitely on the minds of everybody. It's on the minds of the stacking community for sure. Like I said, inflation is right now one of the number one trending um, Google searches in the world. It's on everybody's mind. So to have somebody like you who's actually lived through it and can share the realistic expectation versus what we've made up in our minds you know what it could be looking at historical accounts i think it's i think it's valuable to have your perspective and you're definitely an asset to the community um is there anything in final any anything like uh, you feel like we didn't touch on that you would like to leave the audience with i would say try and uh, search out more people from that period i'm just one person with my one experience and um, from my family's perspective. So um, having multiple people's perspective on that um, issue would probably benefit you. I'm definitely no expert in anything um, other than software engineering. Um, I did spend a lot of time regarding trying to study what happened to us from a very early age and then mixing that knowledge that I gained with uh, experiences that I had so I can share that and I will be sharing that. Hopefully it helps. I really hope that this would never repeat. I still, I'm still hopeful it won't. Um, and, um, but even if, uh, if it doesn't, it's knowledge maybe for you to have and I'm willing to share. And um, yeah, search out more people from different um, countries even uh, what their, their experience was because um, you know, I'm doing my best to share my opinion, but there's definitely more um, people who could uh, who could share on this topic. Well, if I can give you an idea for a video, I would love to hear, uh, and because it probably requires you get going in depth a little bit on it, on whether you think the hyperinflation you lived through was deliberately engineered to transfer wealth 
to the super wealthy because that's one thing in America we always talk about with recessions and and things like that is it's it's the banking system engineering things to transfer wealth so I would love to hear whether you think what you lived through was a deliberately engineered thing or just the consequence of just bad ideas and people it just got out of their control so we don't have to answer that tonight but that might be a good reason to subscribe to star path academy and maybe he'll answer that on a future video sure thing one thing that i can mention somebody did the printing those those <laughs> zeros started appearing yeah <laughs> if they, they did never appeared uh we probably wouldn't have hyperinflation now was it um uh, yeah Let's uh, let's talk about that in a future video. We'll leave it we'll leave it at that. Thank you so much for graciously joining me and sharing thank your you experience. And uh, thank you everyone. Please subscribe to Star Path Academy. Follow him. He's a wealth of knowledge. He he's got three parts on this topic so far, and um, all of them all of them are excellent. So go and check those out. I'll link those in the description below. And thanks for watching. Have a great night.